uh, Chagall, Van Gogh. Um, and, and for today, the focus was, it was requested that the focus be Maude Lewis. So we're mostly looking at Maude Lewis today. So I put together a um, this sort of Maude heavy presentation for the first time. So the idea of the class in the book is to sort of focus uh, and enable people who are rug makers, particularly rug hookers, to do designs based on their favorite artists, not just outright copying the design, which in many cases you can because the artist is copyright free, right? Then you can just outright do the thing. But sometimes you want to do something in the style of a famous artist. Now in the case of Maude Lewis, she has been copyright free since January of last year. So just so you know in your head, oh, I love Maude Lewis. Well, you can do anything Maude Lewis that you want. But the point of these classes is to look at the work of a specific artist and to say, I'm just trying to get a feel for what their tricks are. How do they do it, right? Every artist has a bag of tricks. What is this artist's bag of tricks? Because if you repeat the, tr the tricks like it's a recipe, you're going to end up with a piece of work, a composition, that is going to look very much in the style of the artist. So that's how these classes work. And this book is about to come out now. Carol, did you bring yours? Yeah. No. Um, well, you know, this, book, this is the next uh, book that's coming out with the Rug Hooking Magazine Book Club. So if you're in the book club, you'll be getting this next. I got a, a, a couple of crates of uh, advanced copies, but they were already sold out. So I was hoping that I would have more in for today, but unfortunately I think they're probably arriving yesterday or tomorrow, which doesn't help us at all. But this book is available through my website in case you are not in the Raw Cooking Magazine book club. But the whole book revolves around this idea going chapter to chapter and artist to artist, talking about what it is that that artist does that makes their work iconic, recognizable, unique, right? Uh, trying to pick artists who are both very famous, like Van Gogh on the cover, uh, to artists who are not famous at all. And my hope is that you learn about some new artists and fall in love with them, right? Find some new interests. So today we're looking uh, at Maude Lewis. And I just want to say before we really get started, um, the sort of format for me is always shout outs are welcome. If you feel, you, if you have a thought or a question, shouting out is absolutely fine. That does not throw me at all. It's, I love wild, uh, loud participation. Oh, you, you can be as raucous, <laughs> you can be as <laughs> raucous as you like. So, um, so this is the cover of the book right now. And it, it's not, you, it's not super bright, but I think you're getting an idea of what it looks like, sort of. I might do this for a second. I'm going to do this because I want to read tiny bits to you. Let me do this, hang on. All right, hold on one second. I have very little text. Yeah, actually I think this is gonna be better. So let me go to our first slide and let's start looking at the beloved and iconic Canadian artist, Maude Lewis. So here she is. Gosh, can you see this well enough? Mm -hmm. Ah, it's tough. Is it okay? Okay, you can deal with it. You all are flexible, huh? Sure. All right. Well, you know what? I'll, I'll have to think about whether we want to put the slideshow up as a link just for the group that you could look at later, you know? That's possible, too, to just send Linda a link, and then you could all just log on and look at it in better detail later. So for Maude Lewis, um, let me see if even I can read this slide here. Let me move it over a little bit. Oh, sorry. Hold on one second. We're going to get this thing set up. Okay. So, quote from Maude Lewis. This is the start of the chapter, and it's going to be a very abridged version. She says, I paint all from memory. I don't copy much because I don't go nowhere. I just make up my own designs. And she lived between 1903 and 1970. This is how, this is just a paragraph on how this chapter begins. And I started the Maude Lewis chapter by saying, not a lot of artists can profess to have an absolutely pure voice. Not a lot of artists who have had any measure of success live a no-frills life, untainted by popular culture or current art currents. Maude Lewis was an anomaly in so many ways, and to boot, her personal history as well as her work are peppered with wild inconsistencies. What's on the menu? Whimsy salad with mystery dressing. 
Both Maud and her husband Everett told ever-changing stories of their relationship. They lived in a tiny house that was so close to the tourist route that passing cars could almost reach out and touch its weather-beaten shingles. When she rose to fame, those tiny those cars would stop and visitors would venture inside to meet the odd, shy little woman whose naive portraits of decorated oxen and fantastical renderings of Digby Harbor, and that's in Nova Scotia, were fast becoming the talk of the art scene. At $5 a painting, Maud felt thrilled, empowered, and forever edging closer to her dream of buying a trailer. <laughs> so, and sadly, she never did buy the trailer. That really was her dream. So, you know, the point I'm making with Maud Lewis is that she lived such an isolated life, right? She was not in the swinging art circles with other, with the, all the hipsters, right? She did not know other people's work. She was completely isolated in this remote place, and she liked it there. She did not travel, right? She did not, she was not really interested in art. She was interested in doing her paintings, which were a reflection of the things she saw around her, her immediate surroundings. But she wasn't necessarily interested in art and artists, and certainly not the art scene. So with Maud, we get an incredibly pure look um, at one person's world. So up here, we have the tiny house. Now, I'm sure you've heard about the tiny house because it's now in the uh, uh, Museum of uh, was Nova Scotia or... Halifax, so which is in Nova Scotia. So you can thank you. You can actually visit the little house because it's been moved to the interior of the museum. So you can look at it just the way it was. Now her life story is funny and odd. That these are some of her paintings I have around her here. You know she had a bit of a sad life. I, I don't know if we should layer sort of judgment on it or uh, even emotion on it, but she grew up. Uh, looking quite different, right? So um, she she had a whole cocktail of problems that caused her body to be deformed in lots of ways. So there was a lot going on with the way that she looked from the time she was a child. And to this day, people don't really know. They know polio was one was in the mix, but there was quite a few things in the mix. She had a lot of birth defects. So you could imagine when she was growing up in a small town, how mercilessly teased she was by every all the kids around her. So she had a happy family life. You know how kids are, they don't feel like cold, they don't really feel pain, they, you know, they, they're like desensitized. She was like that too. I mean, she spent as, as bent over, she was always very bent over and kind of sideways crooked. She looked very different. Uh, she was jumping off boats and swimming in the harbor, um, but she stopped going to school very early because she could not handle the teasing. And it was ruining her life, and her parents were very, very loving and kind, and they allowed her uh, to not go to school, right? She didn't need to go to school. She was a girl. So she was allowed to stay home. She had a sort of natural uh, intelligence and intellect, but she could not be part of that world because it just wasn't good for her. Unfortunately, her parents died when she was quite young, and she ended up living with an aunt. And this isn't like a fairy tale kind of story. She didn't have a great relationship with the aunt. It wasn't like a evil Cinderella kind of thing, but... Um, it didn't work out, right? It wasn't, it wasn't making her happy. And so she decided to take matters into her own hands. Now you can imagine this little person who looks very, very different is really at a disadvantage in the big world. So she looked at the newspaper and she saw an ad for a housekeeping, a housekeeping job. This man said, you know, I need a housekeeper um, X amount of days a week. And she answered the ad and when she showed up, she moved in. And that was not part of the deal. And it was this tiny, tiny house. I'm going to show you the house. Maybe let's look at the house. Oh, it's real hard to see. But it's this tiny, it's basically a one room house. We talk about tiny houses now because they're so stylish. But, um, you know, this was really pushing it. It was one room downstairs, you know, I guess open floor plan, with the kitchen right there, and a, <laughs> putting a spin, a nice spin on it. It was t absolutely tiny. It was like a garden shed, really. 
and a ladder, not even stairs, but a ladder like going up, like a, you know, the, the height, the uh, angle of a ladder going up to a loft. And she ended up moving in with Everett. And he, at the beginning, was like, no, this is, what, this is not what I signed up for. I signed up for a housekeeper. But she realized that it was her only chance. There was one person in the world who wanted her. And she did not feel wanted at home. And she thought, I'm going to make this work. Square peg, circle hole. I'm going to make this work no matter what. So she ended up living with him, which was very unconventional, right, in the early 1900s. She ended up living with him. And he was kind of, um, you know, he didn't have a set profession. He was around the harbor a lot. He did a little bit uh, with fishing, a little, a little bit. Um, he kind of scrounged and, and bartered and begged favors. Um, he, he did not have a lot of money by any means. And she did neither. And her aunt gave her a lot of trouble about leaving the house and going to him. And she loved him. And if you've seen this movie, Maudie, uh, you already know that there are some horrible spin, like Bing Crosby type spins on it, where everyone says that he abused her terribly. It's easy to say that after the fact, right? We don't know, but we know that she loved him and she wanted to be in this house. And they had a great, happy life together from all we see and from all she said. Movies do, I don't know, I don't know how much of the movie is true, but the movie is very, very upsetting. She loved being in this house and she immediately started decorating the house by painting everything. Now, he would go out in the morning. Oh, let me show you this first. This is what Digby, so the town, the larger town where they lived was uh, Digby, and there was a beautiful harbor there. And this is what it looked like in the very years that she was just moving in with Everett. So it was a bit of a destination. It had a little concentration of buildings at the harbor. It was known for its lovely views, particularly this one over here on the bottom left, the two kinds of islands, right, meeting, that is very iconic of her work. We see this view with this collection of islands and pretty much everything she does. We also see, you can't see it well here, but the oxen, right, the pairs of oxen with their decorated harnesses, this was part of the culture there. So this is the reason she painted it, because like she said, they don't go nowhere, right? I only paint what I've seen and what I can remember. That's it, that's all I've got. So very, very limited, and very limited scope as far as where she could walk, how she was feeling. Her world was right around her, right? It was right in this tiny house where she painted uh, every, every possible surface. I mean, she painted the stairs, she painted the stove, she painted the windows. And I don't know how Everett, fe fe uh, they ended up marrying, not immediately, but they did end up marrying. I don't know how Everett felt about it when he would come home at night and she would have painted an entire new feature, because uh, it's a lot. It's not for everybody, but it's quite beautiful, but it's a lot. So she spent a lot of time inside painting, and it occurred to her one day, I think I can make a business out of this. I think I have something here. So, right, little entrepreneurial spirit. She's had a hard life, but she does have a bit of an entrepreneurial spirit. There we go. So, let's look at some of her work. Um, these are all winter scenes, and it is a little bit hard to see, but if you focus really hard, you know, her work is naive because she did not know about perspective, the uh, golden rectangle, uh, proportion, right? She didn't know any of the basic things about composition. She does something in her work that people historic, like ancient peoples historically have done, particularly in Eastern cultures, like the Persian culture. If you picture any kind of um, Eastern style painting, the higher up you go in the composition, it means you're further away. So even if there's no perspective, right? Because you're not, you don't have a handle on that you know that the things that are higher up, like the mountains, that's far. And you know that the thing right here, like a row of flowers, that's close. And even though the size is wrong and everything technically is wrong, that's how you read it from, from bottom to top. And that's how you know where you are in the painting. Her paintings work like this because they're very, very flat. She does not have a handle on uh, composition. And of course she doesn't. But it's interesting how the important things are present. 
she figures out, particularly because of the volume of work that she does, hundreds and hundreds of pieces, sometimes she would do 10, 15 pieces in one day. Now these are small little pieces on board. Everett would cut the board for her, and they were like uniform board, and put them in front of her, and she would paint, and if, if, that, if that composition sold, if little covered bridge or little horse, you know, towing a, ca a, a cart or whatever, if that sold, she'd make 20 more of them, because she'd think, okay, well, this is a good one, let's go. So she, she tends to copy again and again and again the same compositions. Now, this is the part that we hardly ever talk about. Because of her physical health, she often isn't the painter. Everett's often the painter. And, yeah. So that's tricky. And sometimes he signs his stuff, but sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he signs it Maud, or she signs it uh, for him. But we know that she didn't paint everything because she really couldn't. There were, with her kind of um, constitution, there were good days and bad days, and there was a lot of bad days. So business had to keep going, and you can imagine how excited uh, Everett was when people started stopping. You know, she put a little sign out front that said paintings for sale. He was very excited because this was the most money that, that they had had, either of them, right? She was making the money. She was the breadwinner. He was perfectly at peace with that because it seems like he was a little bit lazy. So that, that was okay for him. The only way that she got her paints, um, the way she got them was Everett would go to the marina or to the harbor where people were painting their boats and touching things up. And if they finished and there was a little bit left in the pot of the marine paint, he'd say, can I have, can I have that? And so he got almost all of her paint from the marina, scrounging it. He was a great scrounger. And so almost all of her paint is very high shine glossy because it's, it's marine paint, it's boat paint. And there were times when, when she got um, a little bit of traction with finances and she could afford to get a paint set. He got her a paint set at one point, like acrylics. She didn't like them. You know, all of these mixed colors, she didn't like them. So the problem with having only paint that has been scrounged little pots that she set up that she put in little peanut butter jars and little leftover jars, little mason jars. She just dumped the paint and mixed it, like, you know, a very limited color palette. She didn't have all the colors she needed. And this was a thing. So there were times of the year when she would be wanting to paint like a whole series for spring or whatever, or winter, and she literally didn't have enough of the right color of paint. So we get a situation with her work where we get a lot of in wild inconsistencies. For example, it's hard to tell in these pictures, but if you look, these are all snow scenes, right? Mm -hmm. But uh-oh, there's a lot of flowers coming up in the snow, and there's a lot of autumn trees and cherry blossom trees blossoming in the snow. And people would call her out on this and say, What's going on? What's going on? There's a little confusion of seasons here. What's going on? And she would make stuff up. She was a great uh, tale teller, and Everett was too. And she would say, well, you know, on this one particular year, it was funny because all the spring flowers were up and the, and the ground was covered with snow. Or she, you know, she never admitted, and maybe it was a pride thing, but she never admitted the reason she had to go to other colors was because she ran out and there was no more. And she had to cover the space, so she had to go with colors that didn't make any sense. She does this, it's very hard to find one of her paintings where uh, the season is consistent or something isn't a wildly off color choice. And it's not because she was being creative, it was because she did not have the supplies. Um, so that's something to look for. So she paints the same things over and over because people are buying them. From the time she was a little girl before her parents died, um, they had a lot of cats, right, cats underfoot, lots of cats, and they were all called, all called Fluffy. So it kept things simple because she called all of her cats and all of, through all of her life all Fluffy. So here are some of the Fluffies that she's done, and there are hundreds. There are hundreds and hundreds. We don't know how many paintings she painted because it was many a day, and when she couldn't, ever did, and they were pumping these things out like an assembly line. And we just don't know. There are always new ones that come to market. Um, and you have to be careful for fakes because now 
we, I mean, she sold her paintings for $5 a painting. Now they're selling typically for between 45000 and 65000 Yeah, well, she's, you know, now she is in the public eye. People love her story. It's the story of an underdog, isn't it? Everybody loves the story of an underdog. Um, she, she was a very unlikely heroine. And she, she, she made well. She did good for herself in the end. People love this story. And while not all of her paintings are, are good, I'm going to say it, they're not all good, many of them have a kind of a charm, yeah, right? And it really depends on how, like all art, when you look at art, the only thing that matters is how does it make you feel? That's the only thing that matters. It doesn't matter if it's good, right? It doesn't matter if critics like it. It matters if you look at it and it makes you feel a certain way and you think, oh, I love that, I've got to have that. Right, that's the only thing. So here we've got some fluffies. It's gonna be hard to tell. I have a little game set up for you here, but see if you can do this. Now, one of these is not a Maude Lewis, and I'm hoping that you'll be able to guess which one it is. She does do a lot of repeat stuff, right? And the faces of the fluffies are always a little bit different. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's two, sometimes it's three. It's rarely two, I have to say. It's usually one or three. Um, but one of these is not a Maude Lewis. Does anybody wanna guess which one? No, it's not the top right. Top, top middle. Top center. No, no. Huh. Bottom middle. You're right. You're right. You know, the calico, right? It, the, she really, the calico, she really wouldn't take time to put in extra details, right? She's not going to paint a calico if painting a black or white cat is faster. So this is a, there's a lot of fan art, right, that surrounds Maude Lewis. There's lots of people doing illegitimate copies, right? So you have to be careful if you're ever bidding or shopping for Maude Lewis because there are a lot of fakes out there right now. The market is flooded with fakes because she is at her all-time po high popularity level. But this isn't necessarily a fake, but she would never have taken the time to do a calico cat because it's just more time. And the time it takes her to get out her other colors, and, and both colors are correct, like the sort of apricot color in the black, yeah. she doesn't take that kind of time. So, but they were all good. It could have been any, but um, I've never seen that one. Now, once in a while, she did something different. So the point I'm making here that the chapter in the book goes into, we're looking at the themes she did most often, right? So if you're going to design like Maude Lewis and you want to hook a rug that looks like a Maude Lewis, the main thing that you have to do is choose a motif that she did often. Right, because she doesn't have a particular style. She's a naive painter. She's an untrained painter. But what makes her work recognizable is number one, the colors, those marine paint colors, right? Very primary, basic colors. She rarely mixes. She only ever mixes orange and pink. Uh, once in a blue moon purple, but it's very rare. Uh, so mostly we're looking at copying her motif. You want a Maude Lewis, you have to copy the motif. That's going to be the most recognizable bridge between your work and her paintings. So once in a while, we have a painting that she actually did that's very different. These are not the ones that you want to base your work on if you're trying to design like Maude Lewis, because these are both oddballs. We have got a fluffy over here on the right, the whole body. She didn't typically paint the whole body. It was much easier to just crop it, paint, move on, onto the next canvas. She rarely did the whole body. That's very, very unusual, but that is an authentic one. This one here is a, is a crazy one. That is one of hers, and she did take the time to put the black almost like a gable. She never did that one again. That was an oddball. It might have been a special commission for somebody's special cat, like their own cat, but that's an oddball. Uh, these are ones that you won't see more than once. So if you're looking to do thing in, things in the style of, um, you don't want to do stuff like that. Now, she did experiment with, because she loved cats. What does she paint? She paints what's around her, right? She doesn't have a lot of options. She only paints what she knows. She's like a writer, right? I only write what I know, right? So she knows cats. And she did a little bit of a series that are quite good because they look like typical folk art. Right? It's, a, it's part kind of cat portrait, and it's part still life. So she's got, at the top left, cat with balls of yarn and knitting, and knitting needles and a little flower arrangement. And then over on the right, she's like, oh, I have one more idea. Cat, balls of yarn, knitting needles, cat, flowers. Oh, and how about a butterfly? 
right? So then she adds the butterfly, brainstorm. And then on the next one, she's like, okay, two butterflies. We're going to go for two butterflies. So you can see the progression of her work and her thoughts. She's thinking sometimes when she, maybe she's energized, maybe her painting uh, sort of correlates with her moods, her energy, and her health. But sometimes she gives, she gives it some gusto, and she, and she does a few pictures and bobs. So two butterflies. In this one, she's like, forget the flower pots. Let's go for the butterflies. Right? So she's experimenting with her own motifs. She realizes that she loves having the cat. She loves the balls of yarn. And she loves the butterflies. Now, she's going to take it a step further. And these are, these are ones that are not that recognizable as Maude Lewis, but they are Maude Lewis paintings. So on the left, she's never done anything like this after. Cat in a teacup. Right, with butterflies. Now, that's really clever. So it doesn't ring as a Maude Lewis because there's only one of that design. But I have to say, in terms of being a cute and sweet painting, that is a very, that's a very nice composition. Right? And this is really popular now, putting animals into teacups. Right? This is something that's a bit more contemporary. But she was way ahead of, uh, ahead of her time putting the cat in the teacup. And then this one, a bit of an oddball, um, just the cat head uh, looking at the butterfly. She never did that before either. Kind of the evolution of her ideas as she goes along. So while she's not a trained artist, she is painting and she is using her own painting to evolve. Right? She's not looking around at other artists and going, that's a good idea. I'm going to incorporate that into my work. She's, she's building on what she's already done. Still no outside influences. She ends up really liking the butterflies. And she takes out the cats in some places, right? Because this sort of cherry blossom arbor is classic Maud Lewis. That's classic. That works great. It works like a theatrical curtain, having that sort of awning or canopy of um, cherry blossoms or blooms or hydrangeas or whatever. She does different flowers. But she takes out the cats and she puts in the butterflies. So she's figuring out how to come out, how to come out with um, some new compositions. Um, based on her own work. She's building on her own catalog. Now, this is another classic theme, and this is a local theme for her, because to me, it's like, who wants a picture of two oxen? But if you vacationed there and you saw them, this would be a great um, souvenir, because they're all over the place. The decorated oxen are all over the place. So if you wanted a $5 souvenir, this would be a great painting to take away from Nova Scotia. So she's got lots of variety uh, in her decorated oxen. These are busier paintings for her, and these must have taken a lot longer. But some of these are great examples of how she sets out her composition. Flowers on the bottom, oxen, and sometimes mountains or trees or clouds. So still reading up. That never changes, right? She never, she never gets kind of beyond that. Once in a while, she does something like the one on the bottom right here. That's an exceptionally good composition, I have to say. This is really advanced for her. I never, she's never did this again. But the two oxen kind of sideways and the person driving the cart and a little bit of the pond or the harbor in the background, that's very good. I don't know if she realized when she did something that good because she didn't repeat it. So either it didn't sell easily or uh, she didn't like it. But once in a while, it was like, it was like lightning struck and she did something amazing. This is another one of her big motifs, deer, usually deer in winter. Now, these are maybe her least great paintings, right? It depends on how you feel about deer. But with the deer, <laughs> with the deer paintings, uh, a few things show up about her, the naive quality of her painting. For example, if you look at when she's got a stream, she's got the rocks set out like equidistant to each other. Like that would never happen in real life. So, and she probably honestly couldn't make her way down to where the stream was anyway, so she's remembering rocks in the stream, but she's placing them so evenly apart that it really doesn't look realistic. So for me, stuff like that is very distracting. Um, she sold a lot of two deer looking away, you know, at houses or uh, across the lake. She does a lot of the two deer. She likes the companion deers. So this is another uh, really popular composition for her, one of her great tricks, if you're going to work in the style of Maud, one of her great tricks, because it's so snowy so much of the year, she had to figure out a way to deal with snow. So shadows and snow, right? And she, had, she was not equipped to figure this out. 
the best she could figure out was that when you wanted a shadow in the snow, you used light blue. You have to use the color light blue. And there are no exceptions. All of her shadows in the snow are light blue. So I'm assuming that that was a popular marine paint color because it is a very low value of blue. But yeah, <laughs> hopefully, because she needed it all the time. She needed it all the time. She did mostly snow pictures, and she never figured out uh, a different way of handling shadows. Now, another one of her great themes, uh, maple sugaring. So again, it's real specific. Her, to, again, it, it, sometimes it's hard to separate uh, composition being good or being bad. And then you just have to say to yourself, it's Maude Lewis, right? It's folk art. It's naive painting. It, this is an untrained artist. Um, but she's really just showing you like a postcard picture of what it looks like. She's probably actually working from postcards sometimes, photographic postcards, right? Because she doesn't, she's, she's not physically uh, capable of making her way to lots of different places and visiting. So she's got some kind of reference, but she will do this one again and again and again. Um, and this is a popular one to take away as a souvenir. The harbor scenes, I think, are the most um, epically great of hers. She does a lot with birds at the harbor. Birds descending, birds stealing fish, birds squawking and flying away. And she obviously loved watching birds. Um, and it, it reminds me of my grandmother, the way she used to wake up in the morning and make popcorn and watch the birds on the back step. It's like something for Maude about just sitting and watching the birds was something she loved. She really thought they were funny, enjoyed them, uh, and they were very easy to paint. So this is a great uh, composition idea for her. She had a lot of memories of being down at the harbor, right? Because when she was a girl, she's had the same problems, but she's a bit more energized and... Um, her sort of back hadn't bent quite so much. She could, she could stand up enough to walk and swim. So she had really fond memories of being at the water's edge. Uh, probably most of these are painted by memory, um, but these are maybe her best pictures. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, of the harbor pictures, I think these are actually her very best. These are not iconic Maude Lewis, right? These are one-offs. And we do not see these three compositions again, but my God, these are good paintings. I mean, look at this big one here. Composition-wise, that is fantastic. These two as well. The man who's fishing, the fisherman dragging a fish up on board the ship, right? These are things she knows. She knows these things well. So it's easy for her to access those memories and to get them down on the canvas. Um, thing, traits and things that she recognizes are her strongest, um, and, and again, I don't think she realized how good some of these are. This one here of the fisherman cutting the fish open, right, the fluke or hake or whatever that is, that's an exceptionally good painting. And this would have been same size, right, she just got it in her head one day to do that painting. Now, if I saw that painting in a gallery, I would not think that was Maude Lewis at all. That is extraordinarily good. It actually reminded me of this famous Grenfell hook drug. Uh, and I think this is called Hake or something. It's in the Silk Stockings book, right? So this motif, right, this Nova Scotia motif of the opened up fish is a big, is a big motif. And it makes a great shape. And this is the one time that she's using that really iconic shape uh, in one of her paintings. It's, it's an exceptional one. And weirdly, um, although the prices on our paintings are through the roof, the ones that I would say are better, are, are just better paintings, they're not necessarily the ones that sell for the most because people want the iconic ones. They want the fluffies under the cherry blossom arbor, right? You, they want to have the one that you see it and you go, oh my God, is that a Maude Lewis? They don't want the hake, right? Even though it's exceptionally good. These two, right, she only did, as far as I know, these two of a fisherman repairing his net. Come on. How good is that? They are so good. But yeah, either it took too much time, uh, took too much thought, or it didn't sell because she didn't return to that. These are, I'm just showing you kind of a cross-section of what some of hers looked like that were exceptionally good. She, you know, because she didn't know anything about composition, she didn't do anything on purpose. But sometimes lightning strikes, right? And you don't know why. For her, lightning strikes a lot because 
in composition, um, now we talk a lot, it's very dry conversation, but we talk a lot about what makes the best, comp you know, if you go to art school, what makes the best compositions? It, it's, it, I hate these kinds of conversations, but it's the foundation of uh, talking about art and appreciating art. And a lot of art teachers will say, well, there are certain letters of the alphabet that if, if your composition looks like a specific letter, it's a strong composition. So, for example, an X makes a strong composition. An I makes a very strong composition. Now, she accidentally did a lot with letter compositions without knowing it was a thing. So, for example, what kind of composition, if you were to choose a letter of the alphabet, would you say these two paintings are based on? You. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Um, I would say I would say you, but it makes a great composition. It tells a story. It connects motifs. Um, incredible. What about this one? If you were to choose a letter of an alphabet of the alphabet, what about these two? L. L. Yes, I would say L too. It, it's up for grabs, and it doesn't matter, does it? But they both it, L is considered a very strong uh, composition as well because it takes your eye from the back down and across. Right, so your eye is tra traveling right across the composition. And L is a good one. And I can't imagine she knew that she was doing that. Um, what about this one? Yeah. S. Somebody over here is very, very good. Very good. <laughs> yeah, that's an S. You know, it's, it's a stretch, right? But when, your eye, when, when the composition makes your eye do one of these and travel and visit all different, that's an S. And S is very, very strong. What about this? I, yeah, it is. You know, an I is usually one motif, a solitary motif, and in this case, the cat, or the road, but makes a very strong motif. These are all uh, legitimately great compositions. What about this one? Yeah, I would say T. I would say T. And, and you know, this works well for her because you focus the, the activity and the interest behind and then the foreground is fairly bare, but there's another motif. In one case, the, uh, the house, and in the other, the deer. So very, very smart. Uh, and what this shows is that even though she was not a trained artist, she was a very good natural artist. Right? You don't have to be a trained artist to have talent and to let your light shine. She really, really did well, but sometimes she didn't. Right. So there are... There are some that are exceptionally, I think, bad. For example, I think these two are quite bad. It's a matter of conjecture, maybe, but uh, opinion. The split road there is very confusing. The composition is, is confusing. On the right, I don't know, we've got like the, the fingers of uh, hell coming out of the water and <laughs> taking the bridge down with it. But, you know, it's like, what is that? It's a blob. It's the nautical blob. Uh, but, you know, who knows? So these are... <laughs> These are not Maude Lewis paintings, right? These are, this is fan art of her little house. But what would you say, it looks like Maude Lewis. Why do you think these two paintings look like Maude Lewis paintings? Color. Color. Color and fluffies, right. So exactly, those are the two answers I was looking for. The colors, absolutely, and then the fluffy cats. So scattering the composition with motifs that were very unique to her work. That's all you need to do. This is another, another one, um, same thing, fan art, but putting together like a composite uh, composition where you've got the little house, which is an homage to her and uh, Everett, and some little fluffies, and then a bunch of flowers. So just putting together all of the elements, all of her favorite things into one composition. Um, there was other ones like this that just didn't do, they just are not great compositions uh, for different reasons, and she experiments. And to be fair, she doesn't repeat comp these compositions. So the one on the left kind of suffers from too much patterning, right? It doesn't have a lot of color, but it has a lot of patterning. I don't know what the black things are on the tree. It's, it's a confusing composition. The top right, she tries this a lot but it always looks like the deer is in pain somehow and not crossing the river. It's not a happy composition. And I can't imagine if you were choosing between uh, you know, languishing deer and, and cute cats that anybody would choose that one. 
Um, so yeah, she tried a couple of times with that. She, it didn't it didn't work out. And then stuff like this, she does a bit more of a serious landscape, but a lot of dead branches and stuff in the front. And again, yeah, I don't know, composition with dead dead trees in the front. So it wasn't always a home run for her. Um, ironically enough, uh, it it seems to me like her best painting was the stuff she didn't sell. And it might be that the she wasn't it, there was no pressure. She wasn't thinking of it in terms of oh I hope this sells. But you know her sign that she painted that was hanging outside her house while she was alive, paintings for sale, and then the door that she painted on her and Everett's little cottage, those are very good. So it, it, as far as peeling Maude Lewis motifs, look at her um, birds and stuff on the stuff that's actually in her house, um, even over her paintings, because it's very, very good. Even inside her house, it's hard to see here, but she's got uh, up those little ladder steps. She's got little flower pots on each step. It's very good. And I think it was a case of she was doing it for herself. She didn't have any expectation. Um, Oh gosh, what was I doing with this one? Hang on, let me re let me rejog my memory. I had a great idea. Let me just look at my notes really quick, and I had some more audience participation fun stuff. Let's see. Um, well, there was a there was a section of um, the chapter where I had this conversation, um, which is an eternal conversation about art, and the section is called "What is Folk Art?" Now. What is folk art? Originally, it was, it was art that was made by the folks, by the people. Unschooled in art who sought to express themselves and create their own ideal of beauty without benefit of training. Folk art happens to be my favorite branch of the arts because it is not hampered or tripped up by such trivial things as perspective and proportion. Folk artists, having never been forced to respect a vanishing point or a golden ratio, figure out how to problem solve in a natural, creative way, and that is unique to each artist. One of the most common sense ways to solve problems of distance we've talked about is going from top to bottom with the composition. I always call in my head the top to bottom compositions the Maud Lewis layer cake. You know, because it goes, you write it, and if you're designing like Maude Lewis, you want to think about, what do I want first? Maybe a little layer of tulips, and then what do I want next? Like cats, or a house, or a harbor, and then maybe a couple of mountains, and then a few birds. But it is a layer cake, and you want to think of in terms of stacking motifs, if you really want it to look like her work. Uh, sometimes Maude serves, uh, serves up a snowy landscape, with children skating on a pond, and oxen hauling off pikes, on top uh, of a schoolhouse, uh, and on top, and uh, then uh, further on top of houses. In other words, sometimes the stacking, because there's no perspective, you've got something way on the top that's just as big as it is on the bottom because it's part of the story. So that's the thing about folk art is it doesn't always make make literal sense, but it is that is the charm of it as well. So you don't want to agonize too much about uh, that device. You just have to lean into it and accept that that's the way that folk art works, right? You, you can't agonize. Another device, or rather feature of Maude's work is her color flexibility. So we talked about the fact that it was not a choice that she had to be flexible with colors because her supplies were limited. So when that is the case, you have to do, you have to bend over backwards and do back, back flips because um, you just don't have the supplies that you need. And she grew to really love working in the way. She was a creature of habit. Once she figured it out, she was really disinclined to change her practice or to change her supplies out. So, um, so she just kept going. And she went like this for uh, all of her life, doing beautiful paintings like these. Um, you know, she, she did go out on a limb once in a while. She did get a lot of commissions. And she charged a little bit more for commissions. There are videos of her on YouTube where you can see her talking and interacting with customers. Um, yeah, you, you get to hear her voice. And um, she's, a, she's like a no-nonsense character. You know, people come in. She's, she's not um, effusively friendly. She's a no-nonsense character. It's like, what do you want? Do you want a cat? Do you want a harbor? Um, she's, and, and, you know, this is how much it costs. And, oh, you want something different? It's going to cost more. 
but she was a kind of hard-nosed old school I think of like as a, an old-time Yankee um, she's Canadian but you know she, she did so well for herself all things considered um, and when she died I think she died when she was in her 60s um, which was quite a long life for someone that had all the health problems that she had they were doing very very well by the end and sadly her dream of having a trailer in her mind a trailer represented like freedom right and, and not having to really move because the trailer moves you so you can feel however you feel or be as laid up as you are and the travel takes to the trailer takes you to a different view in her in her mind that was the ultimate dream and she died right before she felt that they comfortably had enough to have a trailer um, and sadly, not to end on a sad note, I'm going to keep going a little bit with the presentation, but um, sadly, the really sad ending is um, after she died, because there was a lot of money in the house, burglars broke in, and um, Everett tried to fight them off, and they actually killed him. Oh. Yeah. So it wasn't a happy ending. He died. Um, yeah. So sad. Yeah, they, he was keeping money in the house. He was that old school kind of, you know, it was like under the mattress or in a box or something. Um, but people knew. So not, but they did, all things considered, they had a wonderful life. And what they got was a gift. It was not expected. She was not expecting this life. She was expecting just to scrape through. She got a good life. And she did it herself. She did it off her own back. But she got a partner who supported her who helped her, who put the stuff in front of her, who enabled her. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering, do we know if when they got money together and they were doing well, did he still scrounge the paint? He did still scrounge the paint. He did. It was like a disease with him. Like he, he, even when they had money, he did not want to spend the money. So he, is, he was like one of these um, eternally cheap people. That, but he did try to buy her different supplies. She just didn't want them. She tried them out. They weren't for her. But no, he still scrounged the pay. They felt like they had a formula that worked. And they were very reluctant to change the formula. So he kept doing what he was doing. They, they never lived in a high style. right? They never wanted to move. It was the thought that the trailer could take them away for X amount of months of the year. But five, $5 increments right in the 1960s it's good to have that income, but it's not like it's going to make you rich either. So it's not like she ever sold anything for like more than ten dollars. She never saw. She imagine how she would felt knowing her stuff is selling for sixty five thousand. Like that would not have been a thought. Yeah, that would not have been a thought. So all right. So it is absolutely insane, but it's very collectible now. Um, and hold on one second. Let me grab my next. So I'm going to keep going just a little bit. That was the ball because I don't want everybody to nod off and um, drive you crazy. But, you know, as we get to this last slide for Maude Lewis, uh, we've got her birds have kind of evolved in this uh, one on the left, which I think is an exceptional, very different one. What a beautiful rug composition that would make. This one on the left is one of her most uh, sort of decorative pieces. And in terms of composition, that's a very complete um, scene. Now, does that painting on the right remind you of any other artist, naive artist from at the same time, but maybe an American artist? Grandma yes, Grandma Moses, thank you. Absolutely. So that's exactly what I was going for. You know, they did not meet each other in their lifetimes. They were both naive painters. Oh, I'll never be able to. I had a quote for you on this one. Let's see if we can read it. Uh, they're basically, let's see, maybe we got this. I look out the window and sometimes to seek the color of the shadows and the different greens in the trees. But when I get ready to paint, I just close my eyes and imagine a scene. So same philosophy, untrained artists, right? Grandma Moses is very different because she, you know, uh, Maude Lewis had nothing. I mean, talk about the, the very definition of poverty. But Grandma Moses had a good working farm, right? Um, things were a, a very different lifestyle for her. But her life is between, her name is actually Anna Mary Robertson Moses. Her life is between 1860 and 1961. <laughs> yeah, she had a good long life. In this slide, uh, I wrote, Grandma Moses began painting at 78 years old and sold her first painting when she was 79. 
She lived to be 101 years old, and she was a prolific painter uh, during those years, creating over 1,500 paintings. She never had a class in her life. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was just yeah. going to say, Grandma Moses was a stitcher <coughs> She couldn't, then she couldn't see as well, so she gave up embroidery and started painting. So, yep, so that, that comment, so you heard it was, uh, Grandma Moses was a stitcher first, and then she was losing her eyesight, or? Yeah, she wasn't as good with the needle. She wasn't as good with the needle, and she yeah. picked up the, um, yeah. The brush. <laughs> yeah. Gosh, I was just reading about someone else that had that same story. Um, but sh this is, an, I'm not going to do as long of a thing uh, on Grandma Moses, but, you know, I wanted to do kind of a compilation of naive female artists, um, you know, who have never had a day of training that ended up being really well-known artists who we seem to poach from a lot in rug hooking, right? Because we do get a lot of uh, Grandma Moses-esque uh, compositions during the Pearl McGowan period, right? She does a lot of kind of Grandma Moses and Courier and Ives type compositions. So I started, you know, this design like book is, will be out soon. And if you are in the book club, like I said, it's coming uh, in a week or two. Um, and if you order it from me, it'll probably come sooner. Um, but um, the, I had to cut the Grandma Moses chapter from the first book, but there's probably going to be a design like two right behind it. And, um, and the design like two has the Grandma Moses chapter. So a lot of people, and I'll show you these rugs in a minute, but a lot of people in, in my group who, who watch my YouTube channel, uh, when I put the word out for design, the design like book, so many people wanted to hook something um, that I couldn't put all the content into one book. So for Rug Hooking Magazine, the book, this book, the design like book is about, I want to say like 110 or 20 pages. That's quite large because most of their books are 80 but we couldn't go any more over that because they just wouldn't have it. It's that That's max. So this chapter got cut, but this is how the Grandma Moses chapter starts. Do you already love the work of Grandma Moses? Yes. <laughs> yes. If so, do you think the primary reason is because you feel like it transports you to a place in your memory? Maybe it's in your imagination. Maybe it's a place you can't quite remember, but it seems familiar. And this is a true part of Grandma Moses' story. Imagine a tiny girl, the third of ten children, wandering away on a winter afternoon from the only home that she had known. Imagine what small marks her boots made in the snow as she made the ten-mile walk to Whiteside Farm with her shawl wrapped around her small shoulders. The neighbors, Alice and Ralph Whiteside, offered to take Annie, that was how she was known then, permanently to live with them and work on the farm. If ever there was a Dickensian moment within the narrative of real life, here it is. Annie's father ran a flax mill and was a farmer, but with 10 children to feed in the years immediately following the Civil War, it was hard. Annie made her way to the White Sides, her entire fate in their hands. Would they work her to exhaustion? Would they be loving and kind? Her future happiness depended on their kindness. She arrived at the door and was welcomed inside just as Ralph and Alice were about to have tea. Before she could properly present herself, they asked her if she wanted to, tea, to have tea. And they took the tiny girl and put her in a comfortable armchair by the fire. They put some fine rugs over her lap to warm her back up got the heart glowing. She said the whole place looked like a dollhouse to her. She settled by the fire. There was jovial talk. There were patchwork quilts everywhere. It's a happy ending. So it could have gone either way. And luckily for Grandma Moses, the White Sides were kind people, and they loved her. Uh, they didn't have children, so they were very lucky to be able to keep someone else's child. And this, was, this is common in these days. It sounds very strange now. But it was common. The White Sides noticed that she admired some of their Courier and Ives prints around the house, so they bought her crayons and chalks as a gift. She added lemon and grape juice to make the palette more vibrant, and she started painting. And that's how it started. So she started painting as a very little girl, and they gave her time in her day to be able to work on her paintings. This is her as a little girl over there on the left. That is actually Anna. 
And this picture on top um, is a painting she did uh, very, very early. It's called Home. But we don't know if that was the home she left or if that was the home she went to. And then I put two oak drugs that kind of glorify the comfort of a hearth because that's a huge part of Grandma Moses' story. Again, I'm just doing an abridged version of Grandma Moses. I'm sure you know what her work looks like. The laundry line, right? This is like Thanksgiving. Um, I, I don't know what this one is called, but there's like a patchwork countryside. This is a hook, there's a hooking bee. Uh, she did these epic pictures, same thing as Maude Lewis, no perspective, right? Just stacking things on top of other things, trying to fit stuff in. She did this beautiful painting. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a big pronounced rainbow in it. And then I put a couple of hope drugs that remind me of that Grandma Moses painting. On top, the Lucy Trask, if you've heard of Lucy Trask, 1860, um, and 1870, sorry. Uh, new, I think New, uh, I think New Hampshire, maybe Maine, I think Maine, Maine, yeah, thanks Jane. Yes, very well known, but her famous rug called The Rainbow, this is one I saw in a store that I should have bought. I, well, that's my thing that I think about in the middle of the night, why did I buy it? Well, because it was like $1,200, but yeah, well. yeah, that little thing. But yeah, and then reminding you um, as we close out of another very well known in the rug cooking world, naive female artist, Magdalena Briner Eden, right? Same story, same kind of a timeline, Victorian era person, right? And she is really the first well known rug hooker that we can name. Uh, prolific, right? This is a photo of her that. Um, Somebody in her family gave me for the book. Her chapter is in this design like book that's coming out now. She's in there. Uh, in her famous domestic zoo, her lollipop tree, another completely untrained artist who figured it out and whose work is really recognizable to us now. Now, when I was approaching all of these artists for the design like book, I, the idea was that I was going to draw a composition based on the tropes, right, that this artist does and hope that it was recognizable to people who know, who know and love the artist. And different people hooked each one, right? I, I think I only hooked one out of 30-something. So for example, this is the design for the Mob Lewis. And um, I'll just hold it. Does anybody want to um, help? Yeah, yeah sorry. Uh, this is a small one, but Carol Pollott in uh, Wisconsin hopes it. Um, and I have I have that here larger. I have two or three of them available as patterns. But she yeah she hooked it all in yellow, and it's actually a harbor behind it. But she made it all yellow. You you can do whatever you want, right? Um, but yeah, so that was Carol's version of this. This pattern is called uh, Fluffies at Digby, and um, this one is a little bit harder to read because it is a busy composition. I only have one of these patterns. This is the Grandma Moses. And let's see, is she going to jump out at us? Let's see. I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you all of these because people did incredible work and for the most part nobody has seen these rugs yet. This is Grandma. Yeah, it's a little bit hard to read. Um, oh gosh, who did the Grandma Moses? She did it in a very wide cut. Oh, Joyce. I, Joyce, thank you. Yeah, she did it in a very wide cut. It's really pretty. But it is a white cut. It's a little bit hard to read. We probably should have made it a little bit bigger. But it's just gorgeous. And it has all of the elements. In the actual pattern, it says 1860. In the middle of the rug, they're working on together because that's when Grandma Moses was born. Um, so I have a few of these patterns here. I, I don't have a ton. Um, I don't have a ton. But this is the Magdalena pattern. And uh, Linda Ann Cassau in Canada hooked this one. The way that I was thinking about Magdalena was that, you know, we're very, I think, familiar with her lollipop tree or the lollipop bouquet, which is the tree with all of the big balls on it. Most people think that those balls are fruit, but I really think it's a family tree. You know how the Penn Dutch family trees have the big circles and that you'd write the name on it? I, I don't think it was ever a fruit tree. I think it was based on a family tree. Because Magdalena, her only point of reference was Penn Dutch art, right? She was in a remote part of Pennsylvania. So with this pattern, um, it has the Magdalena tree, but instead of having all the circles, balls on it, I've actually inside the balls put some of her most famous uh, uh, motifs, like the cats, the dogs, the bird with the cherry, the pinwheel, uh, some of her most famous um, 
motifs. So that's the way that the thing worked. Do you think we should show some of the other ones? Yeah, let's do that. Okay, so some of these are in the current Design Like book, and some of them will be in the second Design Like book. Um, so we're going to sneak preview. You're going to sneak preview. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of these. And some of these artists you might not know, but you will know after you hopefully get the book because they're all fantastic <coughs> artists. Should we start with this one? So this one is... Uh, it's real. That's one of my favorite patterns. I don't have this one here. You can order anything from me, but I, I, you know, I couldn't do unlimited stock to bring today. This is Everlyn, Everlyn uh, Ackerman. Come back. Yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely. I can come back with some more stuff. But I mean, I brought a ton of um, patterns. I'll walk you through it. These are all patterns from the Design Like series. That isn't one that I have here, but most of them I do have. So Ev Evelyn Ackerman was a famous mid-century artist. Uh, and in this design, you know, she's um, she's holding her palette. She's in her studio with some peacocks. It's just a whimsical design. This one is based on, it's going to be tricky, huh? Yes. This one, that one is based on um, the artist. I wonder where I should put these down. Should I put them on the floor for now? Okay. Sorry, I'm, so, I'm such a baby. Um, that one is Here, Diana, Agnes Diana. Pelton. Agnes Pelton um, was this amazing uh, 20th century artist. She was, she was known as a desert transcendentalist. I know that sounds crazy. You know who else was a desert transcendentalist? Georgia O'Keeffe, you do know. Well done, absolutely. She's actually a little bit before Georgia O'Keeffe. And she does the oversized flowers before Georgia, Georgia O'Keeffe. And Georgia O'Keeffe is one of her friends. But somehow Georgia O'Keeffe had a better promoter and, and Agnes Pelton's art never really became famous, but she's extraordinary. She lived in a windmill for a good part of her life, um, and she always made these very sort of new agey, very transcendental poems that went with her paintings. Uh, and I find them such a lot of fun um, to work on designs like her. There's a bucket over there. Oh, yeah, yeah, let me do that. 